So this session is um, called Maximising the Value of Research Output. So we want to um, talk about, actually, you know, that's what Dave's sessions go on. Dave's sessions go on. It's called um, Encouraging Impact. It's called Encouraging Impact. And we're going to talk about sort of how open access can um, create more impact for the research people are doing, and we're not going to mention the impact factor at all okay. in this, so that's quite important. Um, so the first speaker, we, we've got four speakers, including me, and then we're going to have questions afterwards, so unless you have something really good, burning to ask after people in person's um, session, then I will ask the next person, and then we'll have the questions at the end, so remember them. Um, and the first speaker is Dave Carr, who is Policy Advisor at Wellcome Trust, um, and he's going to talk about the funders' perspective on all this. Great. Uh, thanks, Deborah, and um, thanks to the organisers for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I think I've got far too many slides for this, uh, for the time slot I've got, so I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of go through the first bit uh, quickly, which I think will be familiar to you all. Um, and then spend hopefully a, a half bit of time at the end to talk more about the impact issues, which I think uh, is really what I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, so, uh, very quickly, um, for those of you who don't know, Welcome Trust is uh, a large biomedical research charity. Um, as a charity, um, something that for many years has been absolutely sort of fundamental to us in terms of um, achieving our mission and having the greatest possible impact um, is ensuring that the outputs of the research we support um, can be accessed and used um, as widely as possible and ultimately in a way that maximises uh, benefits to health um, and society. Um, so that's really been a, a sort of a key focus and something we've pushed for extremely strongly, particularly over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and we have uh, long-standing uh, policies on both um, open access to research publications that we fund um, and uh, maximising access to data sets that result from our funding. Um, so I'm sure this will be familiar to many of you. Our open access policy has been in place for almost 10 years now. Uh, requires that all the papers uh, that we support um, be openly accessible uh, through the Europe PMC database within six months. Um, uh, we provide dedicated funding for um, open access article processing charges, uh, uh, where publication is made open access through the Gold Route, um, and where we, um, more recently, um, over the last two years, where we've uh, contributed funding towards a, um, an article processing charge, we require articles to be made available with a CCBY license. Um, our data sharing policy has been in place from um, just a couple of years after our open access policy, so getting on for seven or eight years now. Um, essentially, we require that uh, um, researchers seek to maximise um, access to data sets that result from our funding with as few restrictions as possible. Um, as um, has been mentioned earlier on, like many other funders, we require um, data management and sharing plans as integral parts of research applications so that we can scrutinise uh, our researchers' plans for sharing data as part of the application process up front, and we commit to, commit to meet the costs of data sharing as an integral part uh, of funding grants. Um, and then I wish I could say more than this, but um, coming very soon, uh, we've been actively considering our position around um, software code, recognising that increasingly software and data outputs are seen as being sort of intrinsically interlinked, particularly in enabling reproducibility. Um, and so we have agreement that um, over the next few months, we will be extending our data management and sharing policy to also um, cover software um, and code outputs. Um, and so um, our own policies uh, sort of come as sort of um, uh, within the context of a sort of a broader policy landscape, of course. Um, over the last 10 years, um, I think there's been a very strong convergence in funder policies um, and a lot of consistencies between certainly uh, where the major um, funding agencies are coming from, so both in terms of increasing numbers of open access mandates, obviously, um, and increasing consistency around the importance of research data and requiring data management plans um, as part of applications. Um, that's in a broader context of um, kind of increasingly sort of high level political support um, and higher level sort of uh, policy consensus statements. So over the last couple of years we've had high profile announcements from the European Commission, uh, the White House and the G8 science ministers for example. Um, and that still is in a broader political context. Um, uh, uh, both in the UK and internationally around sort of open data, big data agenda and around sort of maximising the value held in data sets of all types, so including research outputs but also including uh, 
vastly valuable data sets held in the public sector. Um, however, um, all of this dialogue recognises that there are some really significant challenges that need to be overcome um, to make, um, make this a reality. Um, and um, as a result, um, uh, funders are increasingly um, kind of looking to work in partnership, um, really to sort of try and build the infrastructures and, and sort of create the sort of um, the cultural um, change and momentum along with the support of the research community uh, to kind of make openness a reality. Uh, so just a couple of examples. Um, uh, a couple of months back we announced uh, we were partnering uh, with five other um, of large UK medical research charities to provide a joint funding mechanism uh, for open access, um, so to ensure sort of uh, that the funding was available to provide immediate access to research papers resulting from charities, um, charitable funded research. Um, and that really demonstrates, I think, a sort of growing um, uh, kind of focus of the charity sector around the importance of open access um, and ensuring that the charitable funded research is available as widely as possible. Um, uh, in a way it can be used, but also um, accessible to patients, donors, um, and other audiences. Um, and um, I'll just mention very briefly uh, an initiative that we coordinate at the Wellcome Trust, the Public Health Research Data Forum. Uh, this brings together uh, uh, around 20 uh, major funders of global health research, um, looking at ways to increase the um, uh, access to research data generated by public health and epidemiology research. Um, in ways that are kind of equit equitable um, and ethical, um, so particularly recognising that there are um, uh, particular constraints around data sharing in low middle income countries um, and issues that need to be sort of overcome to make data sharing, uh, to ensure data for generated in those settings can be shared in a fair and equitable way uh, that maximises the benefits for, for all. Um, just very quickly, um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of this was discussed uh, this morning, so um, and I probably don't need to re-emphasise this point, but worth just saying very quickly why funders, why this is really so fundamental um, uh, to funders. So uh, we've spoken a lot already about um, openness being essential to enable validity and reproducibility of research findings. Um, obviously, in terms of increasing the visibility and use of those findings, uh, but particularly in the era of big data, there's absolutely a massive potential for. Um, uh, data sets to be used in ways that could never have been anticipated by the person who originated those data. And opening them up really sort of gives the potential to answer exciting um, new questions and use data outputs in new ways. Uh, for a funder, something that's really um, essential to us um, uh, is around sort of maximising the efficiency of the research process and reducing duplication and waste uh, wherever we can and making things more open uh, hopefully increases the possibility um, that we can find ways to do that. Um, and uh, as I've mentioned already, it's not just about making outputs available to other researchers, it's also about making them more accessible to other audiences, including uh, patients, policymakers, healthcare professionals, and other various other publics and communities uh, with which we work. Um, I just want to say very um, uh, a couple of uh, quick examples of, of kind of, um, that hopefully go some way to demonstrating uh, the kind of value and the reasons why we uh, why we do that. Um, uh, the first one is real, uh, is kind of around the accessibility of um, uh, demonstrating the sort of uh, the advantages of making uh, published content um, available to access and reuse. Um, so I think there's a better, there's a compelling argument that at the very least, um, open access ensures more users um, on average. Um, generate or can see content. I know there's an ongoing debate about uh, the extent to which it confers a, a citation advantage, so I won't get into that uh, debate at the moment. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about some um, some particular examples from content that the Wellcome Trust has produced itself. So, so for example, uh, the Wellcome Trust holds a large Wellcome, uh, in, uh, de a huge database of images associated with biomedical um, medical research and history. Uh, we recently, um, over the last year or so, uh, made the images in that available under CCBY license. I was amazed by the statistic, but apparently it's true. It's led to an increase of over 700% in downloads of that content. Um, uh, we also produce um, an in-house magazine, uh, science magazine called Mosaic, um, which is uh, articles or uh, likewise available under a CCBY license. Um, 
there. And that's, there's really been some very compelling examples of that content being reused and made accessible to a wider audience. So the site itself, um, uh, for example, um, a recent article on the site itself received around 30,000 um, uh, views um, on the Mosaic site. Um, it was produced, um, it was made available by uh, the Jezebel platform and reached um, uh, over 300,000 viewers that way and generated comments. Um, so for example, um, uh, just to give some examples, uh, articles produced in the Mosaic example made available for, to multiple platforms so that we're so sort of far increasing the reach of that content. Uh, it's allowed the articles to be translated, so made available to non-English speaking audiences. Um, and it's allowed the content to be repackaged and reused in new ways so that it's accessible to different types of audiences as well. Um, I won't go into this in depth, this is a, another example of uh, uh, a large global consortium which was around consolidating um, health research data um, and, I don't, and overcoming the barriers to, to, um, to sharing health research data between sites across the developing world um, and through finding ways to overcome these barriers um, it's enabled some really huge um, uh, and landmark studies that wouldn't have been possible otherwise into some of the major diseases affecting developing countries. Um, so um, just to finish off, um, I wanted to say a few words about um, how the Wellcome Trust um, kind of uh, in general tries to sort of assess the impact of the research we fund. So at the highest level um, uh, in our strategic plan we set out uh, six key indicators of progress which, uh, which are the things we're really trying to measure to know the extent that we've been successful in terms of achieving our mission. And very briefly those are around generating landmark new discoveries, creating new applications that will improve health, uh, raising engagement in science more broadly, creating exceptional scientists, developing a supportive research environment, um, and increasing and having a sort of major influence on science um, and science policy. So uh, we very actively um, look to sort of build the fullest picture we possibly can of, our, of the outputs that result from our research to measure how far we've achieved that. And we use a broad range of approaches for, um, for capturing sort of uh, standard metrics around publications, citations, and other types of research, uh, other types of outputs that come from our research. Uh, we do qualitative work to, to uh, develop stories and case studies of the research we fund, and we actively sort of track the sort of future career development of our researchers. Um, so um, I say that the open access um, <coughs> movement in general. Um, uh, has really sort of sparked the available of new and exciting metrics to sort of add to those um, uh, approaches and enable us to sort of um, build a sort of fuller picture of, uh, of the outputs generated from the research we fund. I think there's ongoing questions about the value, value of some of those metrics. We definitely can't capture everything we need at the moment, uh, but it's a really exciting and rapidly evolving field. So I'll leave detailed discussion of this because I know it's going to be covered in some of the subsequent talks you heard, but just as a very quick example of an article-based um, approach. Um, uh, so, for example, capturing information about sort of discussion of research findings on social media allows us to sort of capture sort of new sort of uh, potentially uh, insightful information about the sort of wider impact mm -hmm. of the research we fund and its kind of uh, consequences in terms of stimulating public debate. Um, I just wanted to mention. Uh, very quickly, um, an, an area that's sort of of active concern um, to us is um, around kind of uh, uh, sort of capturing and value, valuing the sort of um, uh, the outputs of the research um, we support, um, and uh, particularly in terms of uh, research <coughs> data. Um, as we've already heard today, there's a really sort of crucial need to sort of build up better metrics um, to help us sort of uh, really sort of demonstrate uh, the reuse of data. Uh, and enable that to be recognised uh, more effectively as a sort of le legitimate research um, research output. So I think there's sort of a two-pronged thing that we need to address here. Uh, there's a need for sort of more consistent use of um, data citation systems, um, as has been described already, and we also need to ensure that those um, that those metrics become sort of uh, more widely embedded in assessment processes, and that's something that we're committed as a funder to work with others um, to help set in place. Um, so just to summarise very quickly, um, I think uh, just a, a few key points um, from, my, from my talk. As funders, um, we're absolutely committed to increasing the 
uh, availability and research of uh, <coughs> and use of research outputs. We passionately believe that will maximise the benefits of the research we support. Uh, we're actively working in partnership with each other as funders um, and the wider research community. Um, assessing the impact of our activities is a considerable challenge in itself. Um, I think measuring the effect that, of openness um, in terms of those outputs is a, is a harder challenge still. Um, uh, but uh, as I've tried to argue, um, open access in itself is helping us to sort of measure new types of impact and get a much broader picture of the research we fund, which I'd argue is a, is a, is a benefit in, its, in itself. So, thanks very much.